the Realty Debate. I'm Manisha Natrajan. And our question today is, is the time ripe for a design shift in India's housing sector? In a rapidly changing world of wearable technology, driverless cars and sustainable solutions, is the Indian real estate industry doing enough to make India's homes future ready? Well, we all know how political structures are absolutely incapable of responding to the many challenges that society faces. So should the lead to develop better, healthy and sustainable life, living and homes be taken by developers? Joining me today are Niranjan Hiranandani, co-founder and chairman Hiranandani Group, Pranav Ansel, vice chairman Ansel API, Nitin Kilawala, practicing architect and director, Group 7 Architects and Planners, joins us from the Mumbai studio. Here with me in the Delhi studio, I have Manit Rastogi, managing partner, Morphogenesis. And uh, also with me in the Delhi studio, Tanmay Tathagat, director, environmental design solutions. We'll also be joined by Sudhir Vora, principal architect, Sudhir Vora consultants, and urban planner and urban law expert. So we've got a really, really power packed panel here. So before I start the discussion, let's just look at what our lives today are or what they're subjected to in urban India. Now, the number of people with non communicable diseases is growing exponentially because of lifestyle changes and response to the rapidly changing environment. Now, heart diseases, what's happening? have increased from about 17% to 35% amongst corporate executives in the past decade. That's a twofold rise, doubling of it. Despite rising awareness, more than half of the men in major cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Ahmedabad and Chennai suffer from diabetes. 42% of working women suffer, suffer from lifestyle diseases like backache, obesity, depression, diabetes, etc. etc. Now, this is a study done by Metropolis Healthcare and Asocham. Now, is, uh, we all know that... Uh, there are scary levels of pollution in most of India's cities. And here's food for thought. According to the recent WHO study of the world's top 20 polluted such cities, 13 are in India compared to just three in China. And we thought China was polluting so much. Air pollution slashes life expectancy by three and a half years for, of course, all the Indians. 660 million is the number who live in, uh, in cities. Now, six lakh deaths occur annually just by or can be attributed to air pollution, asthma, etc. Now, the question that we are asking is, what can be done better? We have shrinking city spaces, lack of public grounds. So where does the onus really rest to provide a well-balanced environment? So Manit, start with it. I mean, you're the big voice of sustainability. So tell us who should take responsibility for it? We all should. I mean, there is no question about that. But first, before I go there, uh, on the issue of space, mm -hmm. right? A simple statistic, if you take the landmass of India and you take the billion people that we are, and that's sort of roughly say 200, 250 million families, and you give each person a 200 square yard plot of land and all the social infrastructure, multiply that by three, mm -hmm. you only need about 9% of the landmass of India to give everyone that level of accommodation. So land is not a paucity. Okay. Water is not a paucity. Energy, solar energy alone, we only need 0.01% of the landmass of India to generate all our energy needs. Mm -hmm. That is not a paucity. So what is the real issue? The real issue lies in the fact that we do not understand the equitable distribution of resources. Okay. We do not understand what is the carrying capacity of a place. Mm -hmm. We do not understand when it uh, simple issues of democracy and equity when it comes to public space. Okay. So, Models of urbanization in India, and we'll keep our argument to cities, urbanization in India have been based and evolved around master plans. What does that do? Land is allocated to people which they own. They put boundary walls around them. Mm -hmm. The only public space that is really left between these parcels of land are the roads, which are the true democratic spaces of the city. And there we don't have any pavements for people to walk in. The true models that you will get where you will start approaching sustainable living is if you abandon the master plan model mm -hmm. and move to an urban design model where the developer or the owner only owns a, the plot immediately under their building mm -hmm. and the horizontal plane of the city is opened up to the people. Oh my God, it wow, is, what a, what, a, okay, let's, Banit, just stop there. This is, this is such an interesting opener to this entire dialogue. I'll abandon the master plan. Nitin Kilawala, come in here, tell us. Abandon the master plan. Everyone, the ownership should be just for the land under their feet and rest of it should be open to public spaces. What do you feel about it? Yeah, I think uh, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Manjit say, says. And... Uh, 
you know, all over cities are going towards huge disparities. Mm -hmm. And this is something which we need to curb. And here the political will also comes into picture. And you don't see housing in isolation or residence in isolation. It is also connected with some very, very basic infrastructure. To start with mobility, the, the transport, the roads. All our roads are full of potholes. That also creates some kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 it's uh, carrying some very uh, basic uh, incendiary conditions. And uh, th th these are something which is very, very basic. And uh, uh, yes, I think we, we must have equitable uh, land for all sections of the society. And it is there. When, when we talk of, say, a place like Mumbai, we, we have abundant land. In, in public domain, so so why this cannot be used up uh, in in a more uh, uh, selective manner? All right, let's hold hold that thought. Sudhir Vora, equitable land for all sections of the society. Currently, even if you had to house everybody in India and assume that you need 250 uh, square feet for each human being only 9% of India's land would be taken up. I mean, this is these numbers are just astounding. So what's going wrong? We have terrible common living spaces. And yes, there are isolated cases of great community living and some township projects. But then they're so isolated that I can't even say that those, the, the ones who are considered as having it all are living a great life either in this country. Well, I think Manith has opened the, the debate as a good opening batsman. And uh, I think the crux of the issue is that our planning processes are still top downwards, top downwards approach. We, uh, the last 50, 60 years, starting with the DDA, which was the first town planning organization created under an act of parliament in 56, we have assumed that whatever government gives us is going to be the best. Now, that's something which has happened in other industries as well. At one time, you didn't have a choice but to buy either a Fiat or an ambassador, and you didn't have a choice in automobiles or in your telecommunication or many other areas. The same thing practically is happening now with housing. You And that's what also has happened the last 20, 30 years after we opened the housing uh, industry to the private developers, you assume that what you give to the public is what they want, what they need, and it's backfired. It's a, it's a, so we haven't yet democratized our planning processes, and land is still assumed to be a, a, a rare resource, which it really is not. It's a mismanaged resource, and this, and we have similar examples of mismanagement in both in other areas: energy, water, etc. For instance, Delhi uses the same amount of water per capita that that Paris does, and we waste about four times more than what Paris does. Just to give you an example in terms of liters per person. So this is this is the bottom line of all this is that we lack democracy in our planning processes. And uh, we haven't let it out in the, in the open to the market forces to, to decide what to build, where to build, how to build. And we've come down to that point where you now find that you are failing on transport, you're failing on facilities, and you're failing on many other fronts to do with the urban sector. All right, Mr. Hiranandani, come in here to into this conversation. I mean, land is not scarce, but it's a complete planning failure. And the top-down approach hasn't been working, but private sector has tried to come in, hasn't it? And there's not been that much of success. Let's be honest about it as well. Uh, Manisha, you have to understand there are two aspects of the whole deal. The first of all, the external uh, planning has to be done by the government or local authority. And in the last couple of years, they have miserably, miserably, miserably failed. If you look at the new master plan of Mumbai, it's such a disaster. And it's scary to think that that's going to be what is going to be done by Mumbai for the next 20 years. I mean, I feel horrified when I see it. There's not a single iconic idea. There is no future as far as the planning is concerned. You put a symmetry in the middle of the town, uh, in the centerpiece of a, uh, of a township. You, uh, you know, you, you, you usurp uh, private uh, green spaces which are there belonging to societies. Uh, you have totally, uh, you know, changed the master plan, which makes no sense whatsoever. So I think, first of all, you need somebody who really looks at a master plan of cities in a healthy, democratic and open sort of way. Second, I think the developers owe something to the country and to the city. 
In some respects, some of the developers have done a beautiful job. We've created huge amount of beautiful infrastructure. Uh, for instance, in our township in Pawai, one third of the space is totally green. We have 100 acres of gardens of, uh, and forests. We do, uh, you, we built the largest sewerage recycling plant in India, and we have lots of green buildings. So I think what we need is a mix of government change and private uh, uh, people initiative also to take place. So I think both have actually lost out in this country. Neither has the government really succeeded in what they needed to do or how to do it, nor have the developers, Pan India, really done their job beautifully. So I think uh, we need both to buck up in the next few years and prove to the people of India that we are tu truly committed to making beautiful cities environmentally friendly, sustainable, and actually using public spaces in the right way. But it's a shame. We have really lost out the last 65 years. Pranav Ansel, come in here. So there are two questions we are saying that number one, master plans have been a complete failure. First, we keep raising this whole question and saying so many cities don't even have a master plan. Now we are saying that the current master plans are complete bunkum. They just don't take care of sustainability or a democratized living. On the other hand, we are saying that the government should be responsible for external spaces and the developer should be responsible for internal spaces. How are you placed on both these arguments? You know, I have, uh, uh, in addition to what has been said by my fellow panelists, I want to add two more things. In India, I was reading in one of the uh, articles, only 20% mm -hmm. of any city is uh, the 20% of the population lives in townships or projects made by private developers. 80% is, not even it, but about 20, 25% is government and 50 to 60% is illegal slum developments. So when we talk about sustainability and when we talk about green environment or the health concerns, we must also understand that 50 to 60 percent of the people are living in slums or illegal colonies and then the government comes and most of these illegal colonies are regularized and made legal. So it is actually a big hindrance to the quality of uh, uh, the uh, environment, sustainability, and the services that are being mm -hmm. provided. So I think that's an issue that we should address. Let me bring in Tanmay. So we have two developers representing the developer community. Mr. Hiranandani says that I would blame the developers also. Tanmay, come in here. I mean, yes, uh, there are two examples of developers who are doing something. But look at the... Now, we've already, in my opening link, I've said that political structures are incapable of globally, not just in India, of bringing large changes, right? Especially in developing countries. So, so how do you think the developers so far have been doing the right thing? And going forward, do you see that intention of actually focusing on great living spaces? <laughs> it's uh, two uh, very different aspects, but the problem has to be, as Manit said, solved from both the ends. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are a few developers and uh, the Hiranandani project in Pawai is a very good example of that where there is a, a developer doing something which is creating a great urban space. Uh, but then how many such examples are there? So uh, I would say that such projects are not the norm, they are rather the exception right now. So. Uh, a, a developer today is doing what is required to meet the minimum environmental conditions okay. and some of them mandate certain things that are being done but as an intent as a design as something that gets back into the fabric of the urban living which goes beyond the boundary of the project it's very rare to see okay uh, but again it's it's a tough debate because you, because you cannot blame uh, only the developer in this game because it's also our uh, expectation from a development to be insular, blocked off and mm -hmm. inward looking mm -hmm. and having all the amenities and services only for ourselves. We've had this discussion many times that if you walk over to a, any new city, go to a Noida or Gurgaon, you'll have, you said, clubhouses and facilities and gym every 200 meters, but none of them open to anyone outside of that boundary wall. Right. And even then, there's nothing for the community of so I would say that there is a concept which is very well known called the smart growth okay. where 
the smartness is not just in gadgets and devices and ICT, it's also there, but it's the way you design in which the common services, spaces, and the investments that are being made by developers in any case are mm. leveraged for the greater good. Okay. Now, if we only wait for the government, I, I mean, government has to pitch in because that's where all our tax money is going. We are supposed to be getting those services that we are now lacking. Okay. Uh, and they have to be, uh, the, the, the top-down planning has to accommodate this. But I would say that in a city like Delhi, where our number one program, I mean, you opened up with the whole problem of air quality, which right. is coming from cars. Why are cars there? Because people are commuting. Why are they commuting so much in Delhi? Because we don't allow mixed use. We right. don't allow don't. people to work and live in the same neighborhood. Absolutely. It's a planning failure. Just that one change will completely ease out congestion in large parts of the city. So you have to do it both ways. That means buildings have to be designed that allow for this kind of a mixed use without encroaching on privacy and other issues and the laws have to permit it as well. Okay, so let's, so we've established the problem and we see and realize that there's a big problem. But there are two big debate points opened up. Number one, should what the developers are making for a community be open for larger public good? Now, this is this is a really interesting aspect. We've never explored on the property show. Is it feasible and possible in a country of such high disparity like India? That's the first question. The second one, which we need to absolutely come back and discuss is, our cities are already such a big mess. Is there a solution? I mean, can you actually change anything in the next decade or not? Or, or, or have we already lost too much time and the jungle is so messed up that you can't fix it. Come back on this very interesting discussion. How do we have more sustainable homes, living and lives in India's urban cities? On the Realty Debate today, we are talking about is the time ripe for a design shift in India's housing sector, looking at the kind of urban crunch that you face, the diseases, the water shortage, the electricity problems, common areas going, air pollution and we've of course lifted a, listed a whole host of things right at the top. Now look at the state of urban planning in India. All our panelists said that this is the biggest, biggest bottleneck. Currently, municipal commissioners shape the city's development agenda. The development agenda gets lost in the limited knowledge of the local context and requirements. There's lack of accountability to the population of people living there. There are short tenures of executives and officers. Every new government has a new program which contemplates a citywide approach and sets a new plan but really doesn't get anywhere. Now look at this simple simple thing. Bangalore and New York have the same population but Bangalore only has 15 technically qualified professionals in areas like water management, solid waste management, urban planning and urban design. And look at the number that New York has, 15,000. Seriously, I mean, when I looked at that number, I was absolutely aghast. Niranjan Hiranandani, I mean, let's go back to the discussion of there is a complete failure at the political structure, at the policy, at the executive level. How are we ever going to get out of the mess? Do we just give up and say this is how we have to live in India? I mean, our cities will keep getting more polluted. There will be more excluded pockets of isolated excellence. And massive or masses will continue to live a really, really terrible quality of life. No, I think, Manisha, there is always hope for the future. I do see uh, islands of excellence happening and people looking at good examples that you really create in terms of what can be possible to do. Uh, the Delhi Metro Rail is, looks like an example of how you have done infrastructure which is improving. Uh, Mumbai is now trying to copy and ape that by putting the metro uh, underground into the cities and trying to get that off the ground quickly. So you do have good examples where people can emulate this kind of good things to be done. Uh, for instance, sewage treatment plants are being improved. Uh, sewage recycling plants are being uh, envisaged. Uh, so a coastal road in Mumbai is uh, planning to be done. So I think the state is taking uh, uh, some action. However, what I do find is that the leadership still is not getting into the grips of understanding what cities really need. And though some people have that idea, I think leadership in this field is lacking. 
So you have leadership in telecom, you have leadership in aviation, you have leadership in other things, but those for town planning and creation of cities, townships, and development of uh, sustainable infrastructure, we are a bloody failure. So I think what we need are experts, architects, town planners, uh, master planners, as you put it. We need lots and lots of them at the highest level to be mandated in order to make and we probably need some input from the private sector to actually show how the good examples. I'll give you one example of sustainability which you mentioned. Uh, for instance, in Pawai, we don't cater only for internal infrastructure. We have schools which cater for outsiders. We have hospitals which cater for outsiders. We open 50% of our gardens to outside people to come and visit it. So all this means that even the developers do create uh, infrastructure which is useful not only for people living within the infrastructure but around it. So there can be an improvement of both sides, the city leaders as well city local leaders as well as I think private developers need to improve themselves. Both sides of the coin have not done their job well. Okay, Pranav Ansel, I mean a very very simple point which was raised that you know what, what could actually improve the air quality of Delhi just just being allowed to have mixed use development how much have you lobbied for something like that knowing that the pollution levels of NCR are just going on the rise? You know uh, lobbying is something that developers do all the time and we've been lobbying for... <laughs> have you, do you really think that this is the way to go? You know uh, definitely if you see most of the developed countries of the world and developed big cities that is the only way forward. Mm -hmm. But for developers, we are generally lobbying for very, very basic issues which address us. Only once we get over those issues, we can address the other issues. Also, the master plans, when they are prepared for most of the cities, they do not take developers into consultation who have been working there for years. Like when the new Gurgaon master plan was made, which is of course a great effort and we've been working in Gurgaon for more than 30 years now. There's no consultation. They don't discuss with us what are the problems we were having over the last so many years. They don't talk to the residents who've been living there. So I think the developers are not taken so much into confidence. Okay. Nothing is discussed with us. So I think that's, so, we are not. So let's ask the urban planners. Are you taken on, into consideration? Mr. Sudhir Vora, have you sat on any of the master plans and given your inputs? Has, been take, has that been taken with a lot of, uh, given importance rather? Yeah, but I'll answer that question, but let me go back to what uh, our developer friends and what's been discussed just now. Um, let me tell you, in the, in the early 19th century, we did have shanty towns in America. Mm -hmm. And the Great London Plague was the, was the trigger which started off the redevelopment of the London area. So it's not that we, our cities are the only ones who have had it bad. There have been historical, historical, uh, stud, uh, hist historical. Uh, 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 there have been occasions earlier where we, where other cities, even London and all that, have been through this whole metamorphosis of change. Okay. Um, uh, this issue of town planning and master planning, there, it goes down a little deeper. Uh, our our constitution does not have the term town planning anywhere in it. It's only after the 74th Amendment of the Constitution in 1994 that there was something which came up with municipalities and panchayats. That's only 20 years ago. The, the, the power to deal with land in the main constitution comes from a little thing which says land and colonization. That's how the states claim that they've got all the powers to deal with land. We, have, we haven't yet matured enough as a democracy to understand the importance of town planning. And town planning cannot be done by developers in any way. Developers have their own points of view. They are there for a business and they're there for a profit. They're not supposed to be, they're not, they, they can't be seeing a hundred years from, from now because that's not their business. So the, the, the issues of town planning, urban planning, urban design, whether you have mixed land use in one place or mixed use in that place are not born, are not going to be pushed by development at all. They are looked at from a larger point of view. Now we have another issue. In America and every other place, you have the mayor, and the mayor actually owns the town. He runs the town democratically. In our, in our system of, demo, of administration, you have a faceless officer, probably an IS officer for two, three years, who becomes uh, an important person for a few years to try and do something without any knowledge, without any background, and with very little uh, motivation to stay there politically. So the crux of the problem of bad town planning actually resides in are in our flawed democracy. 
All right. Manit, would you agree that it can still be done? I mean, our cities can actually completely reinvent themselves. Is it possible? Because so, now we also have population. I mean, our cities are bursting at their seams. When London went metamorphosed or any other city, probably there was not a problem of plenty in terms of population. So population is a strength. It's not a weakness. Okay. You know, it's, a, it's the that. strongest, the strongest fundamental for India today. It's its demographic. It's, its and that's our dividend. So leave that well, leave that aside. I think the key point here is that yes, change is is possible and it is inevitable. Okay. Now the point is that first and foremost, the citizens of India and the residents of a city must understand that you have a fundamental constitutional right: a right to water, a right to breathe, a right to air. a right to walk a right to live livability is a defined fundamental constitutionally it has been established mm -hmm. so first and foremost we cannot be at the mercy as individuals of what the state does we know the failure of the state okay. we know the failure of the state but what is what is more important is that we as individuals have to realize what our power is again okay. the power of democracy now for example we've been lobbying for a project now if you look at delhi and all our cities in india are by and by large have nalas okay nalas were natural drains that went through a city and carried storm water and drained the city and helped fill the water aquifer today all our cities the nalas carry sewage because of the 50% unauthorized uh, uh, development that ex exists in every city uh, like what prana was mentioning So six or seven years back, we started lobbying. Let's clean these nalas up using organic treatment, and get them to uh, get fresh water in. So what do you do? You solve the public health problem: no dengue, no chikungunya. You've got the water table going back up. You modulate the embankment. You've got cycling and walking tracks throughout the city. You can go from Kutub Minar to uh, Sri Ram College of Commerce in North Delhi without crossing a road. Okay. now that is probably some one of the toughest things uh, in india there are pockets where you know people movement tanmay has really brought about big changes i'm not saying it's not happening but this inside out concept in larger urban population just simply does not exist my house is clean i don't care what's happening i i don't even bother once i put the kachra outside my house i don't care whether it's recycled it's separated or not what is lacking in the public consciousness of at least urban middle class affluent india to actually demand and change bring about that change inside out i think it's the despondency it's the feeling that no matter what you do uh it is not going to make a difference we've given into that feeling of uh it's it's futile so uh when we see that as manit said that a small success can breed bigger things it will it will work so take the example of rahagiri for example it is working right mm -hmm. and it's spreading on its own without now a, a very conscious effort people realize that there is a day in the week where we can own the street and do things and just because it has been successful in one place people are feeling that that freedom and the the value of giving up some of their personal space and convenience for the sake of a greater good where they also get something so there's always a problem of a public good versus what i can do mm -hmm. so in a few examples and and i took this example of where you know people are free to go and in and out traverse out of uh, private property is is uh, mr anandari's pro project in in pawai where you have boundaries of buildings and projects but people when they have to go from point a to point b are free to sometimes go within the building footprint oh. and go to the most convenient so you know it's easier for me to then walk down from one block to the other which in other city i would go down take a a a, a car or a motorcycle and do that okay fair enough uh Nitin Kilabala, you've been listening to the discussion. So, so everybody here believes that things can change. I mean, cities can be transformed, uh, whether it comes from the top, from a mayor, and and having more accountability from the top, or is it the people who really need to bring about the change? Where do you stand on that argument? So, first and foremost is the land prices. Our cities are becoming absolutely unaffordable. Mr Ansal mentioned that 60% of people are staying in slums why they are staying in slums it's not by choice it is by force they are staying in slums in in bombay it is more than 60% and and the problem is all our so called luxury houses the houses which has all the parameters which has all the smart building technologies they are all sitting on slum lands why that is happening 
in in bombay 10 years back it was not 60 or 70 percent of slums it was only just 40 percent 45 percent why it is increasing with every successive scheme you know this is the problem and this this is a very very fundamental you must have proper four walls and, and a roof without that you just cannot do anything or all your parameters all your rain rainwater harvesting etc will fall in place automatically okay. yes so what is what is fundamentally required is right to live and live dignified why there are no one bhk houses two bhk houses happening even in the farthest part of the city uh, you know you know uh, the distant towns like palgar or panvel they are all constructing luxury houses for what and for whom Okay. So this is something which is fundamentally, it, and it is nothing to do with private developer. It is our government policies which is flawed. It's an it's it's amazing, isn't it, that we are saying that we, if everybody was given 250 square feet, uh, in, in, in you would still I would square love yards. You say that's right. okay. Provide. Let me. I'm correct. So I stand like that, corrected. 250 square yards. You would still. That's a larger figure than that's, square. That's 2,500 square feet. That's 200. Oh my God. So to. 250 square yards you would still use up only 9% of India's land and here we have a big argument and we've said that again and again the fact that uh, we cannot build affordable housing is because land prices in urban India have just gone through the roof so this is a dichotomy we live with but on the other side I think we've all realized the various issues that we have the big problems that we have I'm going to come back to each of my panelists because they have very strong views and solutions i'm hoping on the other side what are two or three things which need or can be implemented immediately which will bring about that big change we need for healthy sustainable living in india's urban centers stay with us we're looking for solutions solutions to the mess that india's urban centers are and how do we as a people get better quality of living now what are some of the best practices which can be implemented right away mr hiranandani what can be implemented right away as a developer what can you do is it like if you do another provide that's that the I, way to go no i think there are three different aspects of it the first part of it is where the government comes in i think they have failed in the terms of master planning they need to look at what is the best examples which have taken place all over the world whether it's singapore Hong Kong, China or Dubai, it doesn't matter which country or even South America. There are lots of examples of great master planning which have taken place and urban infrastructure has been developed on that. So I think first and foremost, good master planning. Second, I think urban infrastructure, external infrastructure needs to be developed. In the last couple of years, I think government has totally failed in urban infrastructure. Mr. Narendra Modi's idea of smart cities and focusing on urban infrastructure is a damn good idea. I think we need to speed it up. The third is from the developer's perspective. Uh, I think what we really need to look is introspect how we can actually improve internal infrastructure. As somebody said, walking, walk to work concept as walking between buildings and buildings through gardens. I think that aspect of it really needs to be done. And if I'm permitted the fourth one, I think the issue of slums, Jopat Pattis, illegal hutments and things which have created in the last 65 years, which should never have happened, never have happened. It was not needed to happen happen i think needs to be focused upon and we have solutions on the ground but we need to get off the ground in order to do that all right okay so we've got four solutions or at least four things that mr hiranandani would like to see implemented immediately manit you talked about inside outside but what else i mean that's one big you talked about just covering the nalas and creating a walk walkable uh, path between kutub minar and Shiram College of Commerce, you said. All across the all across the city. Unbelievable. You can do it in Bangalore. You can do it in uh, Jamshedpur. You can do it in Bombay. What else? What else? Okay. Can be done? So so yes. So one, I am a very strong proponent of walkability, but I think walkability builds citizenship. Mm -hmm. I have seen Indians misbehave inside cars on the uh, on the roads in uh, in India, while walking the streets of Barcelona or Manhattan are highly civic. So how, so how do you build citizenship? Right is crucial, right? Is there a Delhiite today? Who, who, where is the Mumbaiite gone? Who is the Bangalorean? Mm. 
Mm. Okay, these are these are no, these are issues that are very very important for building uh, for building that uh, the, the ability to build a good city. Absolutely, smart city is one great idea, but we need to build smart communities. Ah, okay. okay, and that's where the thrust needs to go. How do you build smart community? And a smart community will only come about if you can build up uh, you can build up participatory methods. Okay. Okay. Fair so what? Are, so what we are saying is that lo that let look at processes that that make people work together for a common good. I completely agree with Tanmay on that. Okay. So that's one. Two, air. Like I said, there you know, two things that you cannot. Energy is replaceable, right? We have sun. We can go with solar energy. We can go with renewable. Energy. There are many ways of getting energy. Okay. But air and water, okay, are the two irreplaceable commodities. So air, first and foremost. Like I said, right to breathe. Find methods. We we design buildings that are 80 percent that consume 80 percent lesser energy than green rating systems. Mm -hmm. I think green rating systems set their benchmarks way too low. We should set them high. What does that mean? The city consumes that much less energy, and the alternative power, the diesel generating sites that are spewing smoke all across our cities, all across our country, should be effectively banned over a period of 10 years okay. and replaced with energy systems. Again, see, the point is the sun is a shared resource. If you look at all the new economies, the world's largest hotelier today doesn't own a hotel room, Airbnb. The world's largest taxi service doesn't own a single taxi. So when we do developments, say residential developments, uh, you know, whether they're 50 acres, 100 acres, 200 acres, what we are saying is that people shouldn't have two or three cars anymore. We will, within that community, we are, we, are talk, we are saying that we'll talk to the Olas and the Ubers and whoever else comes along the line, place your cars here, Absolutely. let that be a shade pool for secondary cars or primary cars for the entire community. My God, Manit, your Share ideas it. are so revolutionary. I think they've taken up all the time, but we've heard all our expert panelists. I'm going to wrap out the discussion, but I think we're going to end on that very high optimistic note. Things can be done. There are solutions. Our panelists have told us what's wrong. And... The first thing, digital world, but the physical world, as Marit says, communities, the places we live in, how we interact with each other, how we actually start looking from inside, outside and demand better quality of air, water, use renewable sources. Each one of us individual has to contribute to that and then get the government or shake up the government to ask for action. I'm going to conclude my reality debate on this note and hope for a better sustainable living space in the future for all of us. Goodbye and thanks so much for watching.